In this video, we're going to go over some of the bed basics that will be helpful in uh, conducting acoustic or any sort of monitoring of bats in Atlantic Canada. So before we go into bats, just a quick introduction of what the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative is. Uh, this is the organization that I work for. Uh, we are working closely with uh, provincial, territorial and federal governments. Uh, as well as academic institutions. We have many partners. We are uh, a non-governmental organization and not-for-profit ourselves. Uh, we are embedded in all the five veterinary colleges in Canada, as well as the BC Animal Health Centre. So we're a cross-Canada network of experts, partners and collaborators that are all dedicated to wildlife health. So among our own staff, we have wildlife health diagnosticians, we have experts in population health, skilled educators, experienced policy advisors, uh, and as I mentioned, lots of partners uh, are all across Canada and the rest of North America. In general, we conduct two types of, of surveillances. We conduct scanning surveillance and targeted surveillance programs. So scanning surveillance is bring out your dead. Basically, if anyone of the public uh, finds dead wildlife, uh, and they report it to their local government. Uh, the local government often gets these carcasses to us. We investigate and uh, our wildlife health diagnosticians figure out what was the cause of death or what, what is the, the issue uh, of, for this particular case. By doing this and by gathering more and more uh, dead animals, uh, we are able to uh, figure out if there are any underlying health issues that are affecting the population as a whole of that species. Often out of that comes targeted surveillance programs. When we have identified there is a health issue, uh, that's when we really want to dive deep into this and we will actively pursue uh, getting carcasses of these species sent to us whenever these animals die. A couple of examples of these targeted surveillance programs are that of trichomonosis, so a parasitic disease in birds uh, that has plagued uh, birds, especially uh, at bird feeders in Atlantic Canada. Uh, you may have heard of the Atlantic right whale mortality uh, that happened the last couple of summers. Uh, and by doing necropsies uh, on these animals and investigating what is the matter with these populations, um, we develop things like this incident report on the North, North Atlantic right whale mortality uh, and therefore are able to communicate to our governments uh, what can be done to minimize impacts on these species. Other targeted surveillance programs of the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative include avian influenza virus in birds and chronic wasting disease in deer. Now, I, these I'd like to highlight because um, wildlife health has an impact on the health of uh, poultry and, our, and other animals that we farm, farmed deer and, and cows and, and sheep. Um, so by keeping our wildlife healthy, we can keep our domesticated animals, our livestock healthy, and in turn, we keep ourselves healthy. So it's very important to uh, have these targeted surveillance programs. And the final example here is our targeted surveillance program for white nose syndrome in bats, currently um, the biggest threat to bats in North America. Uh, and one of, the, one of several reasons why monitoring programs that we're training you in doing why these are important, because we need to have a better understanding of bats if we want to be able to better manage them and the threats they are facing. So let's talk about bats. So we, uh, Tessa and I and our colleagues, we are chiropterologists. Now that's just a very fancy way of saying we are biologists that are focusing on bats. Uh, and the word chiropterologist comes from the word chiroptera. That is the order that bats are in. So that's the group of, of animals that, that bats belong to. Bats are not rodents and bats are not birds. They are their own unique group. Chiroptera is a Greek word and it literally means hand wing. So if you look at this picture of a, this drawing of a, a bat's wing, you can see that like us, it has five fingers, just very long and thin with a membrane in between. So it literally flies with its hands. Also illustrated are the wing of a bird and the wing of the extinct pterodactyls. Uh, and you can see that the bone structure is very different. So these groups of animals are not related and they evolved flight through convergent evolution. So basically, groups of animals that are not related to each other, but that evolved uh, the, the same mechanism 
because it was useful for their survival. Now, we don't really know how bats became bats. So this fossil here is about 50 or 55 million years old. And it's kind of the earliest record of a bat that we have. And it kind of just looks like bats nowadays. Uh, so we don't really know what came before that. We can speculate that uh, bats may have evolved from tree shrews, tiny mammals that uh, hunt for insects, and they jump from branch to branch uh, to, to eat these insects. And perhaps by having larger hands, uh, you were more successful, therefore more successful in mating, and, and maybe selective pressure uh, caused these hands to grow bigger and bigger into wings. But that's all speculations. We really know very little about bats. They're very, very elusive animals. And that is, that is the theme uh, that keeps coming back when we're talking about bats, how little we know about them. So again, by increasing our ability to study bats and to do this population monitoring, uh, we can learn about these bats and, and better manage them. The more answers we have, uh, the better we're able to protect these animals. Now, bats are very important. Uh, that's another reason why we want to study them. We, we need to protect these animals because they have an important role in the ecosystem. So all bats in Canada uh, eat insects and they eat lots of insects. So thousands of insects per bat per night. And lots of these insects are mosquitoes. There's a very good reason to like bats. Um, but more so than mosquitoes, bats eat a lot of beetles, flies and moth species. And these are a lot of the insects that eat our agricultural crops. They eat our lettuce and our potatoes and our tomatoes. So bats are actually uh, performing this, this pest control service for us. Not only are they keeping an uh, ecological balance uh, and keeping insect populations down for the ecosystem, they're also doing that, um, or by doing that, they are protecting our crops. So it means that we don't lose nearly as many crops to these pest insect species as we would without bats. And as a result, we don't have to put nearly as many uh, artificial pesticides on our crops. So it does save us literally billions of dollars a year. In uh, tropical and subtropical parts of the world, bats uh, eat nectar and uh, eat fruit. And by doing so, they are very important pollinators and dispersers of seeds. Some forests uh, in tropical parts of the world wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for bats playing this role in the ecosystem. As a result of that, um, we have tequila because of bats. Without bats, there simply wouldn't be tequila because the plant that tequila comes from is pollinated only by bats. So take these bats away and then the plant will go extinct and there's no more tequila, which um, isn't just a, a delight for some people to consume. It's also a, a big uh, thing for the economy in, in Mexico. Now, in Canada, we have about 16, 17 bat species. In Atlantic Canada, we have uh, seven bat species. And we can kind of divide all these bat species into two groups based on how they uh, deal with the fact that there are no insects to eat in the winter. So we have the hibernating bats and we have the migratory bats. And I'll go into more detail on the specific species that we have here in a bit, but let's first just talk a little bit about these different strategies and what it means for where bats are. So hibernating bats are around in Atlantic Canada all year round, but this time of year in winter, they are in hibernation. They're in caves, mines, wells, uh, rock crevices. They are underground in places where the temperature is relatively stable, uh, probably around 10 degrees Celsius. This allows the bats to lower their body temperature to this ambient 10 degrees Celsius and basically lower the, the rate at which they burn their energy uh, because they don't have to keep their body warm anymore. And this allows them to survive over winter by being in this torpid hibernation state uh, while there is no food source around. Um, and then in the summer, these bats come, or in the spring, I should say, these bats come out of hibernation and they disperse across the landscape to their summering sites, which I'll talk to you about in, in a moment. Uh, migratory bats have a different strategy to deal with the fact that there are no insects around in winter. So they actually migrate south. Uh, they would migrate, it's very similar to birds, they migrate thousands of kilometers south to places where it's warm enough in winter that there are still insects around to eat. 
And then in the spring, they migrate back north to spend their summers uh, in northern areas uh, where there are more insects to eat than in their wintering areas. And then for the fall, they do that migration the other way and they go back down south. They're very elusive. We don't really know where most of these bats end up. Um, if they are, if they stick around uh, many parts of Atlantic Canada, we know some of them are in Atlantic Canada in some places, but we don't actually know how far north and how far south these animals go. So let's look a little bit closer at uh, the life cycle of hibernating bats. So as I mentioned right now, hibernating bats are hibernating. It's winter, there are no insects around to eat. But come spring, about around April and May, uh, these bats come out of hibernation. Uh, they will be very hungry at that point because they do slowly burn through their fat reserves. So they'll spend early spring uh, trying to fatten up, uh, get their body weight up, and females will congregate together, whereas males kind of are off on their own. Females congregate together in maternity roosts. So in the summer, they will uh, congregate often in uh, trees or in um, attics of houses or specially constructed bed houses. Uh, in the summer, they will give birth to their pup. Now, very interestingly, even though bats are, are very small and they're the size of many small rodents, they actually live a very long life. They can live over 30 years old, but they will only give birth to one pup per year. So in these maternity roosts where the, the females congregate together, um, females will at most have one pup that summer. The pups will grow up within that summer to be uh, basically indistinguishable from adults. They'll be the size of an adult, they'll be flying, they'll be hunting on their own. And when the fall arrives around September, August, uh, these bats will fly back to these hibernation sites, but they don't go into hibernation just yet. They congregate at hibernation sites, what we now call swarming sites. They, they display the swarming behavior. It's a big social meeting ground and they might visit several sites during the fall. This is where bats mate before they go into hibernation. Um, and then come about uh, September, October, these bats go into these hibernation sites and they lower their body temperature again and hibernate for six, seven or eight months. Uh, even though the females or the bats, I should say, mate in the fall, uh, they're not pregnant for 10 months. Uh, they actually delay fertilization until they come out of hibernation. So that's what a year looks like for a bat, just so that you know uh, where you might expect hibernating bats to be depending on the time of year. So here we're gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background information about the seven bat species that you might expect in Atlantic Canada. And this will be important when you start to decide um, which species are you going to focus your monitoring on. So on the left, we have the little brown myotis. Uh, you'll also see that I put a species code uh, with all the species. These will come back when we actually start getting into the, the content about uh, identifying these species based on their echolocation uh, sounds. Uh, but you, you can ignore that for now. So the little brown myotis is uh, the, the most common species in Atlantic Canada. Uh, it's basically all over Atlantic Canada, but likely not in Northern Labrador. It's a species that roosts in tree cavities and in human-made cavities. So that means that it, it can be found in attics uh, and often these bat houses. Uh, this is where you find the little brown myotis. They uh, hunt for food in more open areas, over water, uh, along the edges of forests and in forest clearings. The northern myotis is a species that looks very similar, uh, but its biology is a little bit different. It's in uh, most areas in Atlantic Canada, but uh, not as widespread in Labrador. So central and northern Labrador, uh, they are not known to be there. So this is very much a forest dwelling species. It roosts predominantly in tree cavities like the little brown myotis, but it's, it's rarely found in buildings uh, or in bed houses. And they forage, they hunt for food more in the forest interior and are less likely to venture out into the open. The tricolored bat, 
uh, is a species that, as far as we know, is only found in southern Nova Scotia and southern New Brunswick, as far as Atlantic Canada goes. Um, it, it, roosts, it doesn't roost in cavities, typically. Typically, it roosts among the lichen uh, of trees and among leaves of trees. Uh, but similar to the little brown myotis, it uh, hunts for food over open water uh, and at forest edges, so a bit more of an of open area forager. Then the big brown bat, its name is a little bit deceiving. All of these bats are pretty small. Uh, the first three are around six, seven, eight grams. The big brown bat might be 12 to, to 20, sometimes heavier than that, but it's still a very, very small bat. Uh, the big brown bat, uh, we know it's in southern New Brunswick. We have potential acoustic records of this species throughout Nova Scotia, PEI and Western Newfoundland, but we haven't seen the species uh, and we're not sure if it's this species or another species based on acoustic records alone. Um, so we're not really sure how far uh, the range extends. It's very similar to the little brown myotis. Uh, it roosts in natural and human-made cavities, so can often be found in buildings and bed boxes as well. Uh, and it hunts for food over water uh, at forest edges and in forest clearings. Now here, we're gonna talk a little bit about the migratory bat species. So we have three migratory bat species in Atlantic Canada and in all of Canada, actually. The silver-haired bat, uh, we know it's in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Uh, based on acoustic records, it might be in Prince Edward Island uh, and it might be in Western Newfoundland, but like the big brown bat, we, we don't actually know. We don't have visual records of them either. Um, the, the silver haired bat uh, roosts in natural and human made cavities, so somewhat similar to the big brown bat and the little brown myotis, uh, but they also tend to be found in weird places like wood piles. Uh, they're pretty, uh, pretty liberal in, in where they roost. Uh, as far as foraging goes for food, they can often be found flying in old growth forests. Uh, they're often higher. Uh, above the trees line where the hibernating bat species are usually among the trees uh, and they can be found foraging over open water as well. The hoary bat, which is uh, Canada's biggest bat species, but only about 30 to 35 grams in weight, so still fairly small, um, is in uh, the Maritimes uh, and we uh, have occasionally found it in uh, southern Newfoundland. They might be more widespread, they are a migratory bat species, but uh, they haven't been seen or detected beyond here. They roost among the tree branches, so they're not a cavity rooster. They tend to hang off of the branches itself, uh, and they forage uh, high above clearings and over open water. And then finally, the eastern red bat, which is beautiful orangey red fur. Um, this species is in most of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Uh, acoustic records show that it's in Prince Edward Island as well, although it hasn't been visually observed. Uh, it hasn't been detected in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador so far. This species, uh, like the hoary bat, roosts uh, by hanging off of tree branches. Often uh, they kind of seem to pretend to be pine cones uh, and they can most often be found foraging uh, in and over mixed hardwood forests. So with that in mind, there's an activity uh, for you to think about. So I'm gonna show you a couple of photos of habitat, of typical bat habitat. And, and based on uh, the information that was just provided about these seven species, uh, I'd like you to think about what species might you expect here? Uh, which might you expect they're roosting or commuting or foraging there? So think about that for a moment uh, and then we'll discuss. So this is your first habitat, a hardwood forest. So um, it's not clear cut though, but the species that you might expect here being a uh, deciduous forest is, uh, you, you'll have to think about those forest dwelling species. So while little brown myotis, tricolored bat and big brown bat can roost in the forest, um, they're not the first species that you should think about here. The northern myotis is really a species that you might expect to find here. These good big deciduous trees uh, would offer great roosting habitat for this species as well as foraging habitat. 
similarly, uh, some of the migratory species, especially silver haired bats, uh, might be foraging through here, especially higher over the tree canopy. Um, and the hoary and the eastern red bats might actually roost in this habitat as well. And then here we have more open habitat. So as I already mentioned, more open habitat, that, that kind of rules out, you, you wouldn't really expect these forest dwelling species here. So especially Northern myotis, that's the species you really wouldn't anticipate using this kind of habitat. It's just too open. Uh, this particular picture shows a good corridor with forest on either side that would be used by the little brown myotis. Uh, the tricolored bat and the big brown bat would use this sort of edge habitat as well. Um, and you might actually expect any of the migratory species, the silver-haired bat, the hoary bat, and the eastern red bat, they might be using this sort of habitat as well. And here, a pond. This habitat, you might expect similar species to the previous one. Again, it's, it's fairly open habitat over the pond itself. You wouldn't really expect northern myotis to use this habitat uh, all that much. Um, so little brown myotis and tricolored bat, big brown bats and hoary bats are all known to forage over water uh, and silver haired bat and eastern red bat you might encounter here as well. And here this forested habitat with a couple of cabins. So this is an interesting uh, habitat because this basically has something for everyone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, little brown myotis and big brown bats uh, tend to roost in buildings. So these kind of sugar shacks might actually offer really great roosting habitat for these species. As far as foraging goes, they might not use this, but they, they would still roost in the building and then fly to more open areas. But then the forest itself, like old growth, deciduous forest, this is really where you would find northern myotis roosting in cavities and foraging uh, through these forested trails. Tricolored bats you would find roosting among the leaves and among the lichen. And any of the migratory species, uh, especially hoary bat, eastern red bat, you could find uh, roosting in, um, uh, on the on the branches of trees here. And you might even see that there's a wood pile behind this sugar shack. Um, so that as well as the building and as well as uh, the trees themselves would offer great roosting habitat for the silver haired bat. So any, any of the seven uh, species that occurs in Atlantic Canada, you might expect to find here. And this more open habitat. Now here, I'd say most likely you would encounter little brown myotis here. It's a fairly open habitat and little brown myotis would, would use this. Um, it's too open for northern myotis. Now, if this was in southern Nova Scotia or southern uh, New Brunswick, you might encounter tricolored bats as well, but their range is very limited. Um, you might find big brown bat here as well. As far as the migratory species go, there's not really any old growth forest uh, nearby in this picture. They're very short trees. Um, so the migratory species probably wouldn't use this habitat. They might migrate over really, really high, but you'd never know. So I would really expect a little brown myotis and, and maybe big brown bat, uh, potentially tricolor depending on, on where you are in Atlantic Canada. and this habitat with this tree. So here I can say, I can confirm that this tree was a roosting tree for northern myotis. This, this cavity here in the, uh, this cavity here in the, in the middle uh, was actually used by northern myotis. So any of the forest dwelling species uh, you could anticipate being here. The little brown myotas might roost in such cavities as well. Tricolored bats could use these trees for roosts um, and any of the migratory species and, and big brown bats might use this as well. Um, for roosting that is, for foraging, I would really mostly expect northern myotas to be flying through here. Um, the other species, all the other species kind of are a bit more open area foragers. 
Uh, silver haired, you might expect to fly through here as well, but they're more likely to fly higher uh, above the canopy cover. So really, northern myote is roosting and foraging habitat here. And that concludes our section on uh, the basics of bats.